As we get started tonight, the, the title of the presentation and kind of the discussion tonight will be Templum Dei, uh, Latin for the uh, Temple of God. It's a fitting title for an evening discussion on uh, the language of sacred architecture. So let us begin first our journey by scratching the surface to several key questions. The first, what is the overall purpose and of sacred art and architecture? Since Adam and Eve lost their home in the paradisal world of Eden, things have gone downhill. Any gardener who attempts to recreate a piece of paradise in this fallen world soon learns the difficulties of battling their local thorns, briars, thistles, and weeds. Despite the horticultural challenges we all face, we find ourselves in an ever-increasing world of noise and pollution. This hedonistic world screams for respite despite its pleasure-seeking attitudes. Yet the contemporary aesthetics of speed, newness, consumerism, and the overabundance of information have collapsed, compressed, and fragmented the human experience of what we might call sacred time. Some have even argued that mankind is not only threatened by the terror of time, but that humans have nearly lost their capacity to dwell in time because of recent developments in the built environment. According to Karsten Harris, architecture deals with the terror of time first of all by wresting from an unstable, uncertain environment a more stable order, transforming chaos into cosmos. As we consider the purpose of sacred architecture, let us remember the words of Christer Stendhal, former dean of Harvard Divinity School, who said that the temple was where the divine and the human touched. Hugh Nibley, a historian, writes that the temple is a scale model of the universe, and the mystique of the temple lies in its extension to other worlds. It is a reflection on earth of the heavenly order, and the power that fills it comes from above. But when sacred spaces have incorporated the patterns found in the cosmos, they speak a language familiar to us. For the ancient world, there is an inextricable link between temple and cosmos, heaven and earth. Now let us briefly consider the important role of the architect and the artist. From Genesis to the Middle Ages, God was viewed as the divine architect who measured, weighed, and laid out the blueprints of the cosmos. For the believer, divine order permeates the universe and bears record of its creator. To design, create, or build, therefore, is a privilege and honor and the architect, designer, or artist approaches a role somewhat similar to the gods. But both the architect and artist are what we might call phenomenologists. They are individuals who observe the natural and built world in which we live. They are also ph philosophers and behavioral scientists who offer insights gained from thousands of years of architectural history. This is a task requiring not only compassion and empathy, but the humility to surrender one's ego to preserve tradition, culture, and memory. We must not forget, however, that the role of the architect of sacred spaces does require humility on a yet another level. Moses, we can say, was Israel's architect. He was a messenger, a revelator, and builder who brought down a pattern of the heavenly temple and clothed it with earthly matter. Being an instrument in the hand of the divine is no small task. As Pope Paul VI has said, it is your task, your mission, and your art consists in grasping treasures from the heavenly realm of the spirit and clothing them in words, colors, forms, making them accessible. Now what about site selection when considering new sacred spaces? 
According to Vitruvius, Alberti, Palladio, architects must carefully select a site for a sacred structure that is highly prominent, visible, and elevated. Cartographers place Jerusalem at the center of the world because of its sanctity and importance for the Abrahamic religions. A few examples from closer to home illustrate these points further. Early Mormon town planning, for instance, placed an emphasis on the sacred center with both of its plats for the city of Zion. In an effort to take advantage of Nauvoo's unique landscape, Latter-day Saints reoriented their temple to face the west instead of the east as seen in earlier precedents of their own tradition. The elevated site lent itself to high visibility by passing steamboats along the Mississippi River. And of course, this continues to be a practice as evidenced by the Washington, D.C. temple along the major turnpike of the nation's capital. Yet a further example is when the town center was already occupied, a prominent elevated location for the temple was sought. The Mormon landscape provides excellent contemporary examples of site selection techniques for sacred buildings in general. But closely tied to a building site, we change our topic to orientation and cosmic alignments. According to Vitruvius, he said that the architect should be equipped with knowledge of many branches of study and varied kinds of learning. Let him be acquainted with astronomy and the theory of the heavens. The architect, he continues, must be able to find east, west, south, and north, as well as the equinox, solstice, and courses of the stars. In Chartres Cathedral, we find a particular orientation with the apse facing the northeast. What may not be obvious to the casual observer, however, is that this orientation aligns itself to the summer sunrise on the solstice near an important religious holiday. On the other hand, the orientation of a person in time and space is of supreme importance for Islam. This is evident in the Muslim ability to at all times be aware of the Qibla, or direction in which Mecca lies, and toward which devout Muslims pray five times a day. No matter its location in the world, each mosque is carefully oriented toward Mecca and the sacred center found in the Kaaba. This is a concept similar to those living in Salt Lake City who read their addresses in relation to the temple at the city center. At Stonehenge, we find timeless orientations to the revolutions of the cosmos. The Egyptians were others who paid careful attention to the heavens by aligning their pyramids to the nail of the cosmos, the North Star, and other constellations. At Abu Simbel, our astro-architectural phenomenon, such as the sunrise, was carefully choreographed to provide sunlight to penetrate on a particular day of the year and illuminate the gods. Of course, the Pantheon in Rome provides a further witness of the classical marriage between sunlight, shadow, space, and ritual. Perhaps architects should be referred to as spatial choreographers who construct the human experience through an ordered series of rooms. The path in sacred architecture typically leads inwards and upwards towards the heart of the sanctuary, such as found in Hindu temples. The Mosaic Tabernacle was a portable shrine with a series of thresholds, veils, leading the priestly caste from profane to sacred space. The gradations of holiness embodied in Judaism carried over into Christianity and symbolize sacred episodes of history. These gradations, uh, one example is found in the Sistine Chapel. Here you have both art and architecture combine to provide a symbolic experience from creation to the fall, 
a return to paradise, and then judgment. At times, the transition between profane and sacred is sudden and lends itself to awe. The Pantheon's dark womb-like space creates this type of experience for hurried tourists who rush in off of the streets. Their fast, loud pace is quickly silenced, where time is suspended by sunlight and darkness. Such a scene approaches the principles of beauty. For the Greeks, beauty was a sign of perfection approaching the divine. When all of the parts fit fit, uh, perfectly together so that nothing could be added to or taken away. From optical illusion through the play of proportions, they were able to attain beauty and the aura of perfection. This was not forgotten by the Romans. The Pantheon creates a perfect theatrical backdrop, alluring reticent onlookers um, to engage in a ritual architectural event. From plan, elevation, and section, The archetypal geometry of the circle is ever-present. But we must not forget the beautiful illusion of perfection found in the coffer dome ceiling as viewed from the ground plane. Alas, the best textbook on beauty is found all around us in the creations themselves. Sacred geometry, patterns, proportions, and numbers are woven into the tapestry of plant and animal life. To learn these principles, we must slow down, carefully observe the secrets of the universe. Artistic representations using these patterns can be found in beautiful mosaics in mosques, the rose windows of Gothic cathedrals, to the Buddhist mandala temples such as Bor de Bor. So lastly, we ask, what is the role of archetypes, symbols, and ornament in the experience of sacred architecture and art? Considering the proportionality of human anatomy, as illustrated by the Vitruvian man, we learn that temples are to follow a similar pattern. The classical orders not only represent the proportions of the human body, but symbolize gods and goddesses, saints and patrons. The Greeks embraced the symbolism quite literally at one structure at the Acropolis. Taking it one step further, Christian building tradition during the Renaissance viewed the cruciform plan quite literally as Jesus on the cross, with different body parts and proportions corresponding to parts of the church. For Hindus, the plan of the temple corresponded to not only the human body, but the universe at large, with the most sacred deities at the exact navel of the structure. In terms of proportions, the expansive growth of the golden ratio in plan at Chartres Cathedral is often found in elevation as well. But the symbolic messages come into view when these means of 2D representation are compared side by side. The towers of the moon and sun correspond to the most sacred riridos and high altar, whereas the labyrinth and rose window provide yet another meaning message. Some Latter-day Saint temples, such as the one in San Diego, even repeat a common motif or symbol on both micro and macro levels, leading to contemplation on the mysteries of godliness embodied in the sacred geometry of creation. Other temples are based on timeless and tested proportions found in the classical tradition, each with its origins in the divine canon of design. But sacred architecture must never forget that it has an important relationship with the artist. Where would we be without the rich iconographic program that commemorates sacred people places, and episodes of history. In conclusion, let me end with one final quote by a contemporary theorist, architect, and mentor of mine. Duhani Palasma writes, More than ever before, the ethical and humane task of architecture and all art is to defend 
the authenticity and autonomy of human experience and to reveal the existence of the transcendental realm, the domain of the sacred. Thank you.